How you guys doing? It's so good to be in New Orleans, to be talking about books as opposed to whatever else I talk about. It's good to see you. It's, I'm especially giddy to be on stage with Imani Perry and Natasha Trithway. It's so much brilliance, it's blinding. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, National Book Award winner. We could just go on and on. I want to begin with a question. It's a question that I've been thinking about for a while, and it's autobiographical to a certain degree, but uh, I think it matters in a number of ways. What makes you a Southern writer? Not because you write about the South or you're from the South, but in terms of you and your self-description, what makes you a Southern writer? Professor Perry, would you? Oh, I have to start? <laughs> um, I'm, uh, let me just start by saying I'm so delighted to be in conversation with, um, with both of you. And it's such, it's a great question. I do think that there's a piece of it that one takes it on as an identity. I think it has something to do with um, the grounds, that's the first word that comes as it were, so the, the grounds of history of the nation, and I mean it, and grounds is just kind of one of those ambiguous words, right? We use it to mean foundations, but it's also literally the ground, right? And a proximity, a connection to the earth and its people and the, a kind of multi-sensory quality to one's writing where you're thinking, you know, the, the the sounds of of the blues and the whale and the and the um, the scent of the land and sweat and um, labor, right? I think, and then that on top of all of that is the infrastructure that's built that is the nation, both in terms of laws, but also actually, you know, the architecture. So I think there's something about all of connecting to all of those registers. And in, through connecting all of those registers, actually encountering both deep the, the, the pain of the violence of our history, but also the beauty and the joy. Mm. I think that's it for me. I don't know. You know, when I, I've been on a lot of panels where that question is asked, but what's different about this moment is that Usually I'm the only black writer on those panels. And uh, you know, someone will ask what makes you a Southern writer or what makes Southern writers write the way that they do. And almost always without fail, someone will answer that question by saying, well, we did lose the war. <laughs> and I have to say, well, my South didn't lose there the we, war. Right. So I think some of it has to do with, it seems like for much of my writing life, I've had to insist on why I am a Southern writer, mm -hmm. uh, why I belong in that group as opposed to uh, being outside of it because of a lost war. Mm. You know, I, I was born on Confederate Memorial Day, exactly a hundred years to the day that that holiday was first celebrated, glorifying the lost cause and white supremacy and the attempt to maintain slavery. When my parents' interracial marriage was still illegal in Mississippi and 20 other states in the nation, I don't know how I could not be a Southern writer, and not just because, as Welty says, location is the crossroads of circumstance, but because I inherited this history and this culture mm -hmm. and this place that I had to write to fight back against the received knowledge that would otherwise deem me and my people second-class citizen. Mm -hmm. I think it's that attempt to tell the truth, to engage with history, uh, but also because, you know, one has a birthmark in the shape of a place that's like uh, the place, not where you're from, but the place you want to be from. Mm -hmm. hmm. Place not where you're from, the place where you want to be from. Hmm. Mm. Mm. 
Talk about a little bit about the specter of history, because both of your works are history haunts. Um, it said once beautiful, it says once gothic. Something lovely about it, at the same time something horrific. So talk a bit about how history is mobilized in your aesthetic in some ways. You've, I've heard a little bit in your responses, but talk a little bit more about that. Well, you know, I've always been interested in um, the, both the, the physical beauty of some aspects of the landscape of my home state, uh, its terrible beauty, but also in the way that the man-made landscape tells certain stories, certain histories, and erases others. And so one of the reasons I write is to, to try to recover or to inscribe those histories that have been lost or erased or forgotten. So it's always about um, history for me, but history, of course, is the reclamation of truth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I love the way, Natasha, you identify your, the context of your birth, and I actually think that that's something that, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not exclusively Southern, but there's something particular about sort of identifying ones, because I always say I was, you know, I was born what, um, uh, nine years after, nine, what is it, nine years later, minus 10 days, three miles away from the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. Mm -hmm. Right, sort mm -hmm. of, you know, anchoring mm -hmm. myself as a little black girl, right, in, in the midst of that, that um, terror, yeah. but also this incredible grace, terror, rage, yeah. grace, right? Um, and there is something about, I think, about what it means to live in history and to live on the grounds of history, to walk by, I mean, this is one of the things I write about. What does it mean to, for people, you know, I, I'm, Birmingham is a city, it's not my family is from further north in Alabama. We've only been in Birmingham since the 40s, but, the, the fir, but even sort of the grounds of slavery, to walk by, to be in the midst of it, the ground that you're always, um, sort of the proximity and to think about what lies in the earth. So any place that you stand, there are all these layers of history there and they're not just in terms of the facts, right, that one could study about place or recovering what has been lost, um, but there's also the gesture, the, the, um, the, the clues, right, the, the, the pieces that, that, are, that exist to trace and then what happens you know, when you can't reconstitute it all, right? Then the, the holes, the gaps, the wounds, or when reconstituting it is, um, is anguishing, right? Um, so I think for me that, that that's the, you know, that history, sort of the role of history is actually grappling with the past, but also um, our emotional economies. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps most difficult, how we actually continue to exist in relation to one another, mm -hmm. bearing all of that, which is a lot to carry. Mm -hmm. I was sitting here trying to figure out when I was born. <laughs> 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 what historical event. I came in on the heels of Hurricane Camille. Mm. I mean. You know, and I was born in the back room of my great grandmother's house. Uh, the last of four, and my mother was 20, just turning 21. White folks don't enter in that story in a At certain all, way, right? right? So what do, how do we begin to render, because the way in which we frame this, right, is Southern history and mm -hmm. the cruelty and barbarity that that calls forth in some ways, but there's this other side mm -hmm. that isn't reducible to it that has something to do with the beauty of the life that emerges from this soil, from this place that has a distinct sound, a distinct timbre, a rhythm, um, something precious about it. And I feel that even when I read um, 
in between the lines, as it were. Talk a little bit about the whole thing. <laughs> well, first I have to say, since you just identified um, the historical event of your birth, this is very Mississippi, so you may want to check us, but um, I am uh, BC and you are AC. It, it, that's right. that's <laughs> Y'all know right. what that means, right? Because we talk about, you know, before Camille and after. Yeah, Camille. So, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's one of those things about language, about, mm -hmm. you know, metaphors, about how we understand. Um, and you've been talking just since the moment we walked in about just, you know, something about the way the place smells. Mm -hmm. Something about the way the air is. There, you know, I always feel like I am home when I feel a certain balminess. And even if I feel it far away, mm. it takes me home. Mm. And as difficult as home is, because you, you know, there is all that history, there's the layers and layers that Imani was talking about. There's also, you know, all the things that we made of it and out of it, mm -hmm. um, which is why I think you can still mm. love and hate a place at the mm. same time. Mm. 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 Yeah. I don't even remember the question. That was so beautiful. We're supposed to be talking about all of it. Oh, the all of <laughs> the, it. The, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, the, the whole, whole thing. good thing. Well, you know, this is one of the things. I actually am really interested in the rituals of living, right, as a way of making do. And they can be, it can be incredibly beautiful. So I think about, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> My grandmother used to, Cleaning was like a, not just my grandmother, everybody, all the women in my family sort of clean all day long, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Instead of clean, you know, you sort of move through the day cleaning, right? And it's actually a rich, it's grace, mm -hmm. right? It's like we deserve to have spaces that are um, beautiful and orderly. It's the scent of bleach. It's the, so it's both, oh, yeah. you know, it's the, it's, it's, of course, the beauty of the, of music and movement and, that you know, finding it's it's the it's the the and we talked about this earlier today. It's the fluffiness of a biscuit, or the sweetness of a tea cake. It's these sort of that you bring joy into the as Gwendolyn Brooks talked about the living and the along, right? That that is and that it's daily, right? And so you there are these ways that so many aspects of life knock you down in major ways, but it's also the daily humiliations that are the product of the violences of the history of white supremacy, but also poverty, economic exploitation, you know, labor that actually is, you know, destroying your lungs and your back. And then the, you know, the daily graces. Um, yeah. 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 I think of my great grandmother who made the best Kool-Aid. <laughs> the perfect balance of sugar and water. Was it too sweet? Pinto beans that was so good you forgot you didn't have any meat. Whole cake bread cooked on the top of the stove. Yes. But I also think about the silences that define the house. What was not said. Mm -hmm. What couldn't be broached. What wasn't passed on. Yeah. And when I read your work, Natasha, for example, there are silences all over I was about to say that, yeah. And how does one even in Memorial Drive with the white space, Kiesi talks about this, mm -hmm. the silences. And by the way, I tend to read Memorial Drive and Native Guard as companion pieces, right? They fit together. How do you render the silences of home? Because the silences are so thick and loud. For, you know, I mean, my dad didn't talk a lot. He looked and scared the shit out of me, <laughs> right? And I don't, I've been trying to figure out how to capture that on the page, right? A look that would literally make you stand straight up or sit straight up or make me cry, right? How do you render this? Because the beauty of all, the whole thing, right, is an ugliness that's not reducible to the South as we talked about it, but has something to do with that hard living and hard love that comes out of it. 
You know, a couple of um, images from uh, my childhood and early adulthood come to mind um, that I think speak to those silences. There was a moment that my great aunt Sugar, who <laughs> used to be the one who would signify all the time, mm -hmm. who would have just the right line to put anyone in their place. She got dementia. Uh, and she lived with Alzheimer's for about 10 years. And she began, um, when she started to, to go into that, she began just to, to sing everything she wanted to say. Oh. And so there was a, 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 a musical cadence to her words that hadn't existed before, what, or existed in a different way. And then when she stopped speaking uh, altogether, everything was about gesture. Mm. And she would come and, I mean, this is a woman who used to take me fishing, mm. uh, who, you know, first said something to me very pointedly about what it might mean to grow up black and biracial. Um, she came to the back door and she had just plucked uh, three underripe figs from this tree that was between our houses. And she knocked on the door and stood there silently and just handed them to me. And it was weighted with so much more than, oh, here's some figs. I knew it meant something else. Mm. And I knew that the silence had to do the work of telling me what else it meant. Mm. Now, when uh, my grandmother was a drapery seamstress, and um, right after we lost my mother when I was 19, my mother was her only daughter. She was grieving terribly. But she had to go back to her sewing machine to work. And often, she used to sing. She loved singing, you know, Patsy Cline uh, when she sat at her sewing machine. But when my mother died, she just put pins in her mouth mm. Mm. and sat there and worked that pedal. She never said anything, but I knew she was grieving. And the image of those pins in her mouth was not unlike the image of my mother's lips in that coffin. Mm. 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 You have some tissue. I think I... My Somebody... grandmother always taught me to bring a handkerchief. Yeah. Someone be a deer and bring some, t you got some? Okay. Mm. My Lord, mm. Professor Perry. <laughs> Again, I forget what we're talking about. What were we talking about? <laughs> what were we talking about? Um, silences. Yeah. Um, I was think actually I was thinking though about the about the sound of the sewing machine as you were talking yeah. and sleeping to the sound of the sewing machine and the ways and hearing it hum all night um, <laughs> and then having something new in the morning and I mm. um, and so this is sort of inchoate but I do the sounds that 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 uh, step in where language isn't doesn't work. And I do think that there's something about what we try. There's this quote, I can't remember it, but Toni Morrison says something like, you know, I don't have, I don't have, co I don't have colors, I don't have scent, I just have the words, I have to make the words do yeah. something. But I think, so what you just described is how do you, is, you know, this question of how do you make the words do the things that the, that speech can't do? Yeah. Right? And that is, um, and so some of that is spatial, right? I mean, I think that's the part of um, you know, why those of us, and you're a poet also, but those of us who write prose in the tradition are always both chasing musicians and poets. and poets because of the silence, the work that that silence does, right? Trying to, or to, or, to, or the work that, um, that sound does that we have to figure out how to render. Um, yeah. So let's shift gears just for a second, you know, there's a reason why Plato bans the poets from the Republic. I'm sorry. Plato bans the poets from the Republic. 
Y'all yes. are, are dangerous <laughs> for a reason. Here we are in a moment fighting over history, fighting over who we are again. Mm -hmm. Folks worried about CRT, whatever that is, 1619 Project, 1776. Um, what, what does a black Southern writer offer mm -hmm. in these debates, in this moment? You, you see what I'm trying to reach for? Absolutely. I mean, I think it goes back to what Natasha said. It, the question, the, so I actually am feeling increasingly uncomfortable with the argument okay, are we telling this story or that? The story is the battle. Or the battle is the story. Right? You know, it's not this, it's actually that we have never left this state of contestation and that it has always um, meant or cost our lives, mm -hmm. in particular black Southern lives, the battle, right? So that there's some, that if there's any heroism, right, it's our tradition. Keep, keep, keep speaking, keep writing, keep trying to figure out how to get free. And that is not just a political question, but it's an existential question, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, I think, that's, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we, I believe we offer a corrective. Yeah. You know, um, because as you say, we are still in a state of contestation. Yeah. And, um, to lose that it's, contest. <laughs> um, it's not an option, right? Yeah. You can't lose, yeah. right, that's why. To lose it means we lose both the past and the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the imagination becomes this critical battleground, right? How do we see ourselves differently? How do we see our relationship to each other differently? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then the poets are critical to the future in some ways, to the present and to the past, right? To now, which carries all of that in one, right? Seems to me. The mm. unacknowledged legislators of the world. Ooh. Mm. Well, that was Shelley, you know. But still, <laughs> I was quoting. Act, act. <laughs> no, but still. Yes. Yeah, and, and, a com right, and, a, and a comfort with the ancestors and the spectral presences, right? To carry them forward, that that's. Well, okay, yeah. what does that mean, huh? Yeah. Say more. Well, because the poets aren't afraid of invocation of the ancestors and the variety of forms that the ancestors Well, come. neither are the prose writers, obviously. Well, because we're trying to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. You've been thinking about this. Can we turn the tables on? Ooh, yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. About what? I don't, I can't I remember the question. I should have been the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> because, and I told him I was going to do this. You know, because don't you think that the Alabama, you know, we tend to be more, a little more straight. We should be the moderators of the Mississippians. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this is revenge because I told her earlier that Mississippi belched up Alabama. <laughs> Shameful. <laughs> but this question, can you? What are you asking? I would like you to talk about this. No, I'm, just, I'm trying to figure out what it means to be uh, a Mississippi writer. Right? What does that mean in its details? My inheritance. Right? What does it mean to suggest that Mississippi is a metaphor for America, where its contradictions and its beauty right, captures all that this place is all about? Growing up in, a, in the landscape, you know, when you read a Jessamine Ward's novel, right, she talks about traveling from the coast to, to um, uh, the prison. Parchment. Parchment, I was about to call it Piney Woods. No, that's, that's, that was my prison. Uh, uh, Piney, um, parchment, right? And the difference in the landscape. We're growing up where you know, streets, snakes used to chase you down the street, <laughs> right? Um, and how does that play itself out in, in the way in which I intervene? Even when writing about Baldwin, you know, mm -hmm. I just knew he wasn't from here even though there were some kind of desires, you know, yeah. some, some connections. So I think I've always said 
that if we got it right, the nation could be saved. Yes. If we get it right. Because yes. all the contradictions are kind of here. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's something about what you just said, too, about you know, these long states where the geography is completely different. Right. And so there's all these industries, these different histories within a single state, which is also part of why it can function as a metaphor mm -hmm. for the nation. Right? right, because there's different modes of take of actually encountering the land and its uh, terrors and its dominate the domination of the landscape. Right. Yeah. So what? Did, let me ask you this question. Turn it back. Yes. And then we're going to open it up to you guys. Right. When you're in Chicago and it's snowing and you're working, what does it mean to write? To do what you do from an elsewhere from a different place. What do you call you, I'm going to ask both of you, because you're both in interesting sorts of ways doing that. I just. Well, you know, Chicago is a different kind of elsewhere. Oh, yeah, it's Mississippi up north. <laughs> yes, it, it is up south. It is. Um, and for me, you know, if I'm on the south side and I encounter uh, people, I feel like I'm encountering folks from Mississippi. It feels like that. But it also, for me, as a literal thing, as well, as well as a figurative one, you know, I had family that went there during the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. My mother spent her senior year of high school there. Um, I had people who went there and then retired back, on sugar, retired back to Mississippi. And so for me, it just feels like I'm on a circuit that's part of what's already within my family and the larger uh, tradition of Folks going away, folks coming back. It just feels like part of that, mm -hmm. that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, as you, I, I left the South very young, and I spent summers between Chicago and Alabama, so I experienced the, the Mississippi <laughs> um, culture of Chicago. Um, I often identify, you know, I think I talk about having lived my life experiencing homesickness, whereas there's always this, this sort of departure and return, partially because I don't come from a great migration family. My family didn't leave, I don't have, you know, at this point the only person really, at least of my mother's generation, and most of my generation and my children's generation, it's just like one or two of each generation were not in the South. Mm -hmm. And so a sense of actually being, um, yearning and disconnection and, and as a consequence constantly conjuring up a sense of home wherever I am, whether it is, you know, I did an interview and someone asked me last year on book tour, they said, what did you have for breakfast? And I said, I had grits and toast. She said, oh, you're just saying that because, I mean, no, that's actually what I have for breakfast. You know, this is, this is constant um, trying to um, sort of conjure as a way of, of building up a sense of comfort, I do think that we carry home with us. Mm. We make home in homemaking, right? And so, um, so that's what it meant for me, but it's also meant a, a kind of self-consciousness uh, about not resigning uh, my home, in a, not, not placing it in a nostalgic place, but actually being very aware of what I miss yeah. when I'm away. Before. Your point about um, homesickness, you know, that, that feeling also resonates with me. I, you know, I, I use this epigraph um, in a poem in Native Guard from E.O. Wilson. Homo sapiens is the only species to suffer psychological exile. And so the idea that even if you, I mean, definitely for me at home in Mississippi is always not really at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the home is the thing that you're trying to to, re yeah. to, to recast, to, to make, to conjure. So that's the thing you can carry with you yeah. no matter where you are. So the physical exile that I experience in Chicago is not unlike the actual psychological exile I feel even yeah. when I'm back home. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. There's nothing as powerful and as grating on my ear than hearing Bebe, which is my nickname. Oh. So when I'm 
I go home, I hear Dr. Bebe. <laughs> but there's something so loving about it, but at the same time, like, you know, so yeah, it's just kind of. So I just see, I just reveal my soul to you. I just told you my name is Bebe. Okay, before we turn it over to questions, I want to ask this question of the poets. When you see the world, when you look out at the state of the country today, um, what comes to your heart, what comes to your mind, what comes into your gut? I want to hear what you have to say. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. I had a poem in Native Guard called, My Mother Dreams Another Country. Mm. And this is a poem about her uh, in 1965, early 1966, pregnant with me, you know, uh, product of an interracial marriage, about to be born in Mississippi at that particular historical moment. And she's wondering what world she's going to bring me into, what it's going to be like. Um, she died in 1985. So just think about all the things that have happened in the world since then that she never got to see. And for a moment, it looked like that other country she was dreaming was coming into being. I wouldn't say that so much now. Mm. Mm -hmm. It would look a lot more like the world she left and the world that she was in in 1965. A lot of things would remind her of that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I. I, I keep thinking about to the moment when the one who shall not be named was elected president. And the rage I felt in my immediate, the words that immediately came to my mind were, I cannot believe that my mother had, was born and raised in a white nationalist state and spent her life fighting against that and now has to spend her last years back in one again. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know. And, but, I, but I think at present, the, what, the feeling that is often coming to mind is I don't know what to tell my children. Mm. I don't know what, you know, I, when they were, I, I felt, and perhaps that was misplaced confidence, when I, they were, I felt like I knew what to tell them in terms of sort of moving, coming of age, and what struggles to pick up, and how to, make decisions about how to live a good life. I don't know what to tell them. There's so much disaster. I mean, I tell them, you know, you don't, you don't submit to, to the disaster, right? You keep struggling, but how? I'm at a loss. With that. <laughs> you know. we're, we're real hopeful, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get the Jameson coming soon. Irish whiskey's flowing. With that, we want to invite you to, to, if you have any questions, we want you to be succinct uh, as best you can. Um, there's a microphone here, uh, and as we wait for folks to queue up, I'm, I, I can ask another question about um, from whence hope, yeah. given what you've just described. Because I know when I read you. Um, there, it's there. Yeah. So talk about from whence hope. And then what? Uh, you want? No, no. Uh, well, um, you know, um, the other night somebody asked me, um, you know, as a poet, do I ever get sick of writing about the stuff that I write about? <laughs> and, and by that, you know, the person sort of meant, you know, our difficult knowledge, our troubled history. Um, and I asked her, I said, does the fish get sick of the water? You know, it's just, it's just the world that I swim in. And so what makes it a hopeful act 
as opposed to you know whatever a, a dis, an act of despair is 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 writing itself is is the making yeah. of art you know when you when you make something out of that mm. it is the triumph of hope over despair the main thing is you know shelley wrote that poetry is the mirror that makes beautiful that which is distorted mm. I had someone once ask me, do you ever write any happy poems? <laughs> and I didn't have an answer at that moment. I have it for you now. And I have rehearsed it because I'm ready when I get that question. Because it's so condescending in a way. It, it's it's well-meaning but condescending. So, you know, I quote Shelley again and I just say, you know, poems are records of the best and happiest times in the happiest and best minds. So despite whatever it is I'm writing about, to be in the act of writing, to make the thing, is when I'm at my happiest. And that is hope. Yes. Oh. Yes, you see, Professor Perry is going to let that stand. Yes. yes. Good morning. Speak up. Yes. In 1964, my dad was in his full military uniform and we were going back to San Antonio. We stopped in Mississippi. And uh, he asked where were the restroom and the guy pointed over to the bushes. So here's my dad in his full military uniform. He goes, everyone gets back into the car. So we're in 2023. Um, this is a manifestation of the hope just your presence right here, uh, the three of you right here. So um, I'm thinking of Bob Kaufman, solid, solitude crowded with loneliness, and you guys are talking about silence, and I'm thinking about the concaphony of silence. So if you three were in front of this microphone, what would be your question? See, I, I probably wasn't supposed to be the moderator. <laughs> I get overwhelmed. <laughs> Emotionally and psychologically. I guess I, I but I do, I, 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 I am interested in a sort of general question, which is about what are, the, what are the stories that are appropriate to tell in this moment? I think that's a question that I would ask. What do we need to, what are the stories that we need to hear that we're not hearing? Mm. I would have came up with both of their books, my favorite sentence in each book, and said, how did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, you want to? Yes? Hi, um, thank you for being here and uh, for hearing me out. Um, good news, I flew from Chicago down here, and I had just enough time on the flight to read Monument, your uh, most recent oh. book. <laughs> exactly enough time. I was, we were landing. I was finishing the last sentence, it, or the last uh, poem. It was great. Um, there's one poem in there that I, I hope everyone has read, and if you haven't read it, maybe you should. It's called Southern History, mm. and um, that's kind of been a theme through all this. Um, but as I read it, th there's a, a history teacher who seems to think that Gone with the Wind is, is how, you know, that's how history should be portrayed, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he wants to race to get through Reconstruction, and, and you know, he's got this, this and, and as I read it, I thought to myself, okay, here's uh, Mr. DeSantis and his, you know, wokeism and all that, and, and so I'm just wondering how is it that we, we can, since this man obviously has grander ambitions, and, and that kind of frightens me, but how can we fight against that? How can, we, how can we stop, how can we prevent, I guess, the spread of you know, this idea that um, there's one dominant notion of history and anything else just shouldn't be discussed, shouldn't be yeah. you know, considered? Thank you. Yeah. Thank, so, you. Thank, thank you for the, yeah. yeah. You. you know, that's, that's a great question because you know, he's, you know, talking about the poem of mine, um, you know, I, I am talking about being in my senior year history class and reading this textbook. And so it becomes a question of the textbooks. And, you know, we know that um, the Daughters of the Confederacy were instrumental in creating the, the narratives that, you know, so many people cling to now. They did it with the... Uh, uh, 
erecting of monuments and naming of all sorts of buildings and other public works, but they did it with textbooks. So, you know, in 1984, when I'm a senior in high school, the, the stories that are in my textbooks, what's being told about slavery, about the causes of the war, its aftermath, is very troubling. Yeah. And when I went to teach at Emory University, you know, in the 90s, one of my colleagues told me that there were still schools in the state of Georgia that were using those textbooks. Mm -hmm. So then we have an attempt at a corrective where we tell a fuller and truer version of history. And now that's the very thing that people are trying to prevent us doing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's an answer, but it, it made me think about, yeah. his question made me think about that's where we are now. And you know, it's, a, it's that question, and I, I, it makes me continually think in it, it about um, actually the context of the antebellum period and enslaved people stealing away to learn to read and the estimates of something where 10% of, of in, formerly enslaved adults could read at the time of emancipation and that it actually out, being outlaws is what is required of us now, that we actually have to read the books anyway. We have to, and do it in a way that is sustained, and organized, right? It's, to succumb to this is, act, is really untenable. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I wanna get these questions, these three questions in, so you can yep. ask them, and then we'll answer them as we can. So ask, please, yes. Yeah, the question is, how do you cultivate listening to the small voices an environment that is surrounded by big voices. Mm -hmm. You talked about silence as though it's something we should almost be afraid of, but you almost seem to have worked past that. So I'm curious, as individuals, how do you work past that? Mm -hmm. So how do you cultivate listening to the small voices? Yes. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to be succinct, but I was very taken by what, I, I put myself in my own place of where I was born. I'm born in 65 in San Antonio, and at the same time we're looking at moon landings, I had the Klan burn out my neighbors. Mm -hmm. and, and I've always tried to resolve that. And right now I'm a substitute teacher and I've been teaching a lot of English and history. And the kids, you all know this from life, kids in high school now are so full of anxiety and doubt. And I tried to explain them, and I just wanna see if you agree with what I said to them. That instead of seeing history like we talked about in one of your last questions as a, as a line of bad to progress, I explained it to them more like a hostess cupcake, little, the little circles that go around um. on the way up. And I said, I think that the reason they're feeling so bad is because they've been on a wave down. Mm. And I thought about my own life in the 60s and then various periods of the 70s or 80s where you were on your way down before you went back up. And I wonder if you agree with that analogy. Progress or circles, progress or circles yeah, in terms of how little, we think of history, yeah? yeah. <laughs> yes. I was born in 1946 and grew up in North Mississippi, uh, Grenada, Mississippi. That was a hotbed of segregation, mm -hmm. of Jim Crow laws, of institutionalized racism, you know, supported by the legal system. It was a hard time to be a black person, a person of color. You had to stay in your place where it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now my question is, can the panel acknowledge the, the significant progress that's been made mm. since that time with the civil rights laws? And most white folks, in my opinion, have nothing but goodwill for black people and people of color. And we, we want everyone to succeed and have opportunity for education and economic progress. So uh, that, that's my question. Thank you so much. So there's progress. So we got a 56 seconds. Can I say, oh. <laughs> can I say something though really quickly? There, that may be a, a stated belief, but there's an inconsistency between the fact that the majority of white folks voted for Trump and that assertion. <laughs> they don't vote again. So that inconsistency has to be resolved in order. What I always, one of the things I always say is, Without question, black, we know we have friends who are, we have intimates, we have family, there's relationships of love, but there's an earned skepticism, mm -hmm. and it's still being earned. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do something to overcome that deep skepticism because it's dangerous for us not to have it. Mm -hmm. We can't function right without mm -hmm. it. Yeah.
And to acknowledge progress, yes, of course. We're here, you're there, we're all together. This might not have, could not have happened right. at other times. But that does not mean we need to be satisfied with where we're at. At all. 